This is the Surly Grognards for May 8th, 2017. This is Peter Bowman, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Eric Carlson. How are you doing tonight, Eric? I'm doing all right. Excellent. So, we have a topic this week uh, that was given to us by uh, one of our viewers, uh, Tachi. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, largely, it's going to be talking about how to... Well, I'll go into the full details on the on it, but largely we're going to be talking about how to basically make a make a game world a bit more bit more mature than your sort of your usual, uh, as it were. Uh, and we'll right. Get to that in a bit. Uh, but uh, we'll start things off as we try to do. Sort of talking about what's been going on recently, sort of you know gaming wise, as far as we're concerned. Um, it sounds like Eric, you've been playing some more Eternal Crusade. It's a terrible game, but it's. Like I was saying earlier, too, it scratches a very particular itch. <laughs> well, it allows you to play a space orc. Yeah, exactly. That is the itch. <laughs> <laughs> you get to shoot. You get to sh- you get to use a chopper and shoot things and kill space marines. Yes, and, and scream wah. There's a button that lets you scream wah. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> yeah, I could see how that would be uh, appealing to you. You can scream wah and charge. The, just. You scream while you charge the point, you hit them with your chain sword or, or buzz chopper or power claw or whatever the hell you're using. It right. doesn't matter. It's something to hit people with. <laughs> uh, grab a big shooter, you just spray all the DACA, just fill a room full of DACA. It's great. <laughs> nice. Yeah, everything I've read about it says that it's a really, really flawed game. Uh, yeah, and from yes, and, and it, it's got balance issues up the wazoo with uh, with yo-yoing balance with every patch. Um, a a toxic self cannibalizing community. Unless you're playing orcs, in which case all I ever ever does is scream wah and charge the point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're losing. Let's go charge this point. <laughs> I see. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's fun as long as you don't expect too much of it. The problem is, especially leading up towards release, because I was following it, um, sort of, is that they really promised the moon and they managed to hit the upstairs neighbors. Wow. To the neighbor's annoyance. <laughs> they they overpromised by a lot. And, and way underdelivered. And way underdelivered. And I, I think part of the problem is it's it's like five guys, <laughs> not right. an entire studio. Right. <laughs> and from what I've been hearing, it's uh, it sounds like their their sort of free to play model is one of those grudging. Fine, we'll go free to play. Right. Here you can play the game, but um. Yeah, anything, all this stuff that you you can, pay, we need to still make money somehow. God damn it! Yeah, yeah, and, and it's there's a bit of that. Yeah, a- and they really want you to buy the game. They really, really do. Yep. Would, would you like to have a jump pack? Well, you got to buy the game. Uh, want to advance a decent rate? Well, you got to buy the game. Want to do anything? Got to buy the game. I love the fact that from what I, from what I've seen, they you know it's, it, they have that classic, you know, here's the rewards from this particular match. It would be more if you bought the game. Yep, in every match. Yep. It's like, oh god, shut up! I know. Yeah, but from what you were saying this uh, the other day, you there was a different 40k base game you were going to play this weekend that uh, I think you were more excited about. Oh yes, um, so friendly local gaming store Hobby Bunker. Um, is host to a, a, a gaming club, and they did. Uh, they decided to expand from 40k into Shadow War, so I jumped right on that fucking bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked, Eric. Shocked to hear that you did that. Um, and I had a lot of fun, uh, and it was nice to to play in a larger group of people playing war games in a in a store because I haven't done that in a while. And um, particularly Hobby Bunker. I really like playing at Hobby Bunker. It's got a lot of space. It's um, It's got a really sort of like that weird sort of like tucked away store with all the cool stuff that you were never allowed into as a kid. Right. Because <laughs> they had too much cool stuff and you'd want it all. 
that that's hobby bunker and I, I i like hanging out there the problem is they have such wonky hours and they they're just a pain in the ass for me to get to right um but yeah i got to play shadow war this weekend um apparently they're going to be doing a, a campaign not every week but every other weekend ish and right. um yeah and uh i lost both the games i managed to play in um one was against Necrons, who is way too cagey about staying outside of my charge range. <laughs> no, 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 well, no. Well, apparently he had been pra- he was telling me he had been practicing against uh, one of his friends, and his his friend was playing orcs. He's like, I know exactly how to deal with this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Necrons, who the fuck plays as Necrons and and this in Shadow War? This guy apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Noise. And the other one was against a um, an Inquisition team, um, which was a bloody bloodbath. <laughs> nice. The particular scenario didn't have bottle tests. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Shadow Wars is a, a skirmish-based game. You have a, a group of guys um, numbering somewhere between 3 and 10 or 20 of your orcs. <laughs> and... Um, it's sort of like a has some RPG elements in the in the campaign, like you you earn advancements and whatnot. And a bottle test is if you've lost a, a particular percentage of members of your group because they've been shot and taken out of action or had got curb stomped by ten thousand inquisitorial acolytes, <laughs> 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 then um, then you have to test to see if your guys just say fuck it, we're gone. Right. So this particular scenario didn't have that. So, um, yeah, I took literally 90% casualties. Ow! Yeah. Um, here's the funny bit. Like, more than half of my guys that got taken out of action at the end of the game rolled on the injury table and got what doesn't make, kill you makes you stronger, which is an advance! <laughs> All right, then. Oh, that's... And I got to watch my knob play Mary Havoc um, through a, a, a knot uh, of troopers that got too close to him. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, um, what ended up losing me the game was when he went, I need to deal with that knob. <laughs> I'm going to dump everything I've got on him. <laughs> and then he ate three more guys before he finally got taken out by the Inquisitor himself. <laughs> It was rolling really, really well for his uh, for his combats, and you know, having a power claw helps. I can imagine. I, yeah. I can definitely imagine. Oh, look at you! You've got multiple wounds. That's nice. I have a power claw. No. <laughs> you bought armor for this guy. That's nice. I have a power claw. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. For me, uh, didn't actually do my, uh, or my, my usual tabletop game didn't meet this week. Uh, my Thursday game didn't, neither of my tabletop games actually game played this week. Uh, my Thursday crew, we, we all, most of us got together, but, uh, one of us was a bit, got, show, had to show a bit late kid stuff, you know, whatever. Right. So, uh, we basically, and the, one of the others was, you know, out of town, uh, for work. So we ended up, uh, we had, you know, had dinner and then we ended up playing a board game. Um, I don't, I don't know if I've mentioned cool. this one before. Uh, we played a board game called uh, Bootleggers. Huh. Okay. I don't. I haven't heard of this one, but it sounds fun. I mean, it involves uh, bootlegging. Yeah. It's it, it it's. I'm I'm guessing 1920s style bootlegging. Yes. <laughs> no. You. Every player is basically playing a. Every every player is a different gang. Uh, and you're basically trying to make the most money selling illicit booze at speakeasies. Nice. So basically, you know, you every turn you check, you roll to see how much booze you produce, and you basically you basically go to different speakeasies to try to sell your money, sell your booze. The thing, the interesting little, it's got a couple of interesting mechanics about it. Um, one is there is a you get there's a deck of cards that you get everyone gets dealt the same number of cards out for it from it that that are a bunch of it's the quote the muscle deck, and it's numbered. The deck's numbered one to seventy-two, and every player gets twelve cards. Okay. So X amount of cards will be used, and you get three from each deck. Um, each subsection of it. It's broken into three. Yeah, it's broken into th- there are three. There's sort of four categories of, of of. It's basically the numbers are broken in in categories of, of four different categories, um, and you get three cards from each category for each player. Mm. Um, 
I something along those lines. At any rate, so you're so every player has an equal number of each sort of bracket of of muscle cards, and you play them to determine you know who gets first action that each each round. It's sort of so you're basically bidding each round, and the, there are certain things you do like you have to. You you have what's called you've got your boys which are your influence that you assign to speakeasies to right. sort of get control over who's got the control of the speakeasy and if you've got control of the speakeasy once you get it open then you get to determine you you, you have access to priority priority sales and then you can determine you know who else can get in um, unless someone has influence there in which case if you have influence there you can get in but you don't necessarily have you know priority over the dude who has the person who has you know, control over it gets gets first chance to sell stuff there, etc. And there's a lot of different other stuff. And there are like these uh, other cards that you get that you basically you get. There's a list of uh, the interesting thing is the higher the value of the muscle card, the more you have to pay actual money to pay money to use it to basically tell your boys to go out and do it. You basically have to pay them. So the more powerful it is the more cash you have to pay for it. Um, okay. And. What was the other thing that? Uh, and there's a different deck of cards that are basically uh, the men of action cards is what they're called, which are either things to get you more influence, uh, more to get to get more influence to improve your stills so you produce more booze, uh, improve the speakeasies, uh, screw with other players, etc. And you can also you also have to buy you also have to buy trucks to deliver your booze. <laughs> right. So it's all about building up a sort of a an engine of you know booze production, supply, and places to sell it. It's a decent game. It's a little flawed, but it's a it's a solid board game. Uh, and its theme is fantastic. And the the pieces for it are great, because you've got these little plastic trucks that you, you get... Basically, your booze production, these, you, you for, for tracking, you've got these little wooden cubes. And you can load them into little plastic trucks. <laughs> That's awesome. Um... And your little influence counters are little plastic gangsters with Tommy guns. <laughs> okay, that that's they, they clearly know their market. <laughs> it, it is a the, the 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 game itself is a it's a the the actual pieces are really nicely done. The card art's great. Um, it's just a really nice game. I wish it was mechanically a little bit. I was a bit. I wish it was a little bit better mechanically, and I wish. There were. It was a little bit. There was. It wasn't quite so linear in terms of how you go about winning the game. There aren't like different paths to victory to get to the the end. Victory point is who has the most money, um, and there aren't there aren't any different ways to do it. It's literally you produce booze, produce booze, sell booze, produce booze, sell booze. Try to make the most. Uh, and it's which means that it's you know. It's a straightforward game, and but it's. <sighs> I've been spoiled by a lot of the other sort of the the German style board games that have, like they all have a you know they have a yes there's one victory condition but they're different ways about to get to that victory to to get to that victory condition, so so, hmm. so you know you. It's you know it's hard. It's not like as. It's not as obvious. Like so, the big thing is that it's you know eventually becomes obvious who's winning. Right. And that means the person who's winning is going to get hammered down by everybody else because that's how, you know, that's how that works. You know, if you've got cards to screw players over and games like this need them, they're going to be focused on the person in the lead because, of course they are, he's in the lead. <laughs> and in a, a lot of the more, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of the German style games, it's often clear, like you know, people who are people who are in the lead, but they, they do a better job at sort of obfuscating it to a certain degree, so it's not right. quite as easy to read who's definitely about to win. <laughs> so I don't know. It's it, it's a good game, but it's not in like even my top ten, I'd say. But mm. it's a good game. Oh, I, I enjoy. Um, I enjoyed it. Speaking of stuff that happened this week on the the my my Tuesday Shadow Run game. Ooh, yes. Um. I, I just want to mention this because it was awesome. So the the current story arc is they're tracking the, these giant awakened wolves that got loose from a, a research facility through the the, the blooded urban hellscape All right, that, sure. that is Roxbury in twenty in the twenty seventies. And um, there have been hints of a a, a North style ra- um, Ragnarok cult kicking around. Which is, of course, when we track all this stuff down, is exactly when the blizzard rolls in. 
So, you know, we'd been joking about, like, how it was going to be Death Dealer riding a wolf. Turns out Chris did exactly that. It was Death Dealer riding a fucking... Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer riding a wolf. <laughs> In a blizzard. <laughs> Complete with a red cloak flapping around behind him. And my character comes up out of the, um... Out of the sewers we're tracking them in with his um great coat flapping behind him because he ha- has a fetish for World War One Germany, and you know snow lightning strikes and backlits us and the wolf howls with its super son- with its um supernatural fear ability, which means it's just me that pass uh, it's me and the two other mages that pass it and everyone else books it, and then a magic wizard sword fight happens. In a blizzard with a giant wolf and a death dealer. It was great. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful, man. That that's beautiful. In a cyberpunk game. <laughs> that makes it better. It really does. I know. <laughs> and I'm not even a huge cyberpunk fan. And here's the thing, I'm like I I'm like of course, my character would realize what's going on and be, like, annoyed by it. Because he, he's intentionally a pastiche of, like, anime and, and superhero tropes without meaning to be. And is self really self-aware about it. Right. <laughs> so he's making fun of Frank Fazetta here. The whole time I'm whispering to Chris, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, that's I fab. felt bad for for Hannah and Leland because they're the people with guns, and they ran away as soon as the wolf howled because supernatural fear effect, and they didn't have the willpowers of six and seven that mages typically have. Right, and my guy who's built to resist such shit. <laughs> right, because he's a monster hunter. Because he's a monster hunter. <laughs> Oh, that's great, man. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I wanted to mention that just because it was great cinematic, completely just absurd for Shadowrun, and it was fun. <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's, for me, because I got to participate. I felt sorry, for, particularly sorry for Hannah. <laughs> she finally ran, like, the fear effect ran off. She ran back just as we're mopping up. <laughs> Aww. Oh well, <laughs> and the wolf. Then the wolf got possessed by a, a Shudim, which is an, a malevolent spirit that will possess corpses and ran away. So we had to track the a zombie wolf, a, a horse-sized zombie wolf through a desert, <laughs> through a blizzard. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful absurdity, man. Yes, it was great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Um, I really haven't had much else. I've, you know, I've been nothing. I haven't been do, do, had much particularly of interest come up for me this this past week. I've, you know, I've been playing Skyrim. Right. <laughs> In other news, water's wet. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and spent, spent, a, spent a little while this week. We didn't do the Star Wars game this week because Nick was busy and I had, uh, I decided I, you know, if Nick's busy, it's probably a good week for me to take an extra week to get prep work done for next session because, um, stuff happened last time. Right, right. Well, we got to get some people into some, um, back to tanks and, um, I need to uh, retcon my message to, uh, Bourne's. Because I need to make at least one bug pun. <laughs> it was an intelli- It was an inte- uh, a secret intelligence uh, bureau that we c- covered with giant bugs. Yes, and I believe there needs someone- to be some sort of insect pun in there. I believe someone mentioned that actually. Okay. I don't remember who. It might have been Word. I don't remember. At any rate, uh, we do have a topic for today. Shockingly, yes. Uh, it comes to us this week from Tachi, uh, who mentioned to me in chat, actually. Uh, he, so Tachi's group uh, that he that he the uh, game masters for, uh, he's working in a new game world for it. And they asked him uh, basically, they wanted to make the he wanted they wanted him to make the game world a bit more mature than normal. Um, okay. They asked for a sort of mature, you know, 
Tachi tends to, from what I understand, tends to favor sort of, you know, more, a bit more lighthearted and, you know, sort of, you know, I guess four color-y, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to sort of describe, okay. describe uh, sort of, you know, uh, game. Uh, and, but they asked him to make it a bit more mature, so he started working in the game world. But he asked, you know, if you have, we have any tips on how to make a game more mature, as that's what his players have asked for for, the new, for his new game world. And by mature, one of his players wants a more battle on five feel. One wants a quest for saving virgins for, from sacrifice, and the last wants him to make it more brutal at punish. Wants to be more brutal at punishing them for their mistakes. So my first thought about hearing this was um, evil cult conspiracy. <laughs> All right, because you can have. You, you can have the, the politics of, of your higher ups either being sympathizers, sympathizers or actual uh, members of the cult. Um, you can have sus- people being suspected of the cult, but trying to to but use it and trying to use that as a way to undermine its credibility. You can totally save virgins from sacrifice because it's a fucking cult. <laughs> and what's worse than being captured by a cult? Not a lot. They're either going to flinch you convert you or put you in a blender and pr- then probably eat you because <laughs> this is an evil cult we're talking about we're not we're doing like crazy lovecraft cult here we're not doing like the, like we're not doing like the, the, the fucking scam cult leader wants to get laid and get rich type of deal <laughs> well i mean again that's, I would, you know... would, but you could put that in there he just happens to be a psychopath also <laughs> Well, I mean, that's the thing is you—you you don't even have to like. You can have multiple types of cults that are sort of scattered, you know, things scattered throughout things, uh, along those lines, like you know, and you know, honestly, the—I have to say this: the you know, the dude who is you know running the, the cult as a scam type thing, that's actually a fairly mature theme, right? From it, just a you know, it's, it's true. Especially, you know, you've got the sort of conflict between the dude who's running this whole scam cult and his, you know, dedicated psychotic followers. Yeah. <laughs> and you could of... even have the, the guy who is like, the, the, the cult leader being, this has gotten completely out of my control. I have no idea how to stop this anymore. And if I leave, they will kill me. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's riding in the back of a tiger and has no idea how the fuck to get off. Exactly. <laughs> this <laughs> It was just supposed to be a scam for an ugly guy like me to get laid and get and get a little money, and now they're killing people and calling me the Messiah and not actually letting me leave the compound because it would be too dangerous. <laughs> what the fuck? This is not what I wanted. Actually, I really like that idea because you could have the do the stuff I previously mentioned and still have the guy the 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 leader be like guilty but not that guilty like i this is not my intended purpose at all this is not what i wanted this got way out of control <laughs> yeah i mean and then you you also have you know you can also sort of look at you know this sort of thing from a sort of the other side of stuff where you you can have someone who sort of started a you know not a cult per se but you know sort of like a well something that grows into a cult but that's not what they intended in you know, someone who's got, mm. like, legitimately good intentions, like, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll you know, sort of, you know, the classic sort of, you know, I guess, I'm trying to think how to phrase it, you know, sort of, sort of self-actualization, sort of, you know, inner peace, hippie bullshit. But, like, his whole movement's been sort of, you know, he's been Co-opted. insulated from the, he's been insulated from the rest of his, rest of his, you know, followers by, you know, his lieutenants who have sort of co-opted the, the movement and have sort of dri- driven it to their own ends, and their own darker ends. And he has no idea what's going on. Like, you know, mm. so you've got the really sort of dark, evil, sort of, you know, manipulative, and again, this is not a, this wouldn't lead to sort of, you know, the classic sort of, you know, evil sort of fantasy cult that, you know, sacrifices versions to elder gods. But it's like, you know, we've got sort of a more sort of, you know, Scientology-esque, uh, Yes, situation I'm calling, yeah i'm calling yes i'm calling scientology a cult because it's a fucking cult it is uh, like whatever your belief systems are or what you believe about scientology the leadership runs it like a fucking cult yep <laughs> um so you, 
but like any sort of that's that style of any sort of cult like that, that's you know that's uh, that is about like you know basically fleecing their members and and so on and so forth so it's like you know you've got the your schmucko members the, who are genuine devout believers and then you've right. got the sort of the upper leadership who are the who are basically you know manipulative sociopaths who are just scamming the fuck out of everybody and are very carefully leading the revered leader who the the the, the lower rank the, the lower initiates are devout believers in and so you've got right. this sort of two different layers with you know you know and the the like and their their belief their sort of their actions are not what the like the followers actions aren't exactly what the founder would have wanted necessarily because everything's been corrupted and co-opted by the the you know his lieutenants but right. He doesn't realize that because he's been insulated from them, and they've been insul- the you know his followers have been insulated from him, and, and so you know you've got the opportunity for you know to move in and basically you know, sort of expose the upper and bo- the top and bottom to what the middle's been doing, and what happens then. Right. Um, of course, then uh, then you've got the problem like if you're st- you're still looking for for saving virgins from sacrifice here. Like, the, the bottom isn't not culpable in, in that. Like, they, 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 they are guilty. They've been sacrificing virgins. <laughs> well, that's, I'm, not, I'm not even thinking about that for that particular angle there. I'm just saying that's another sort of thing to have in the world that mm. is a, it's another mature theme to look at. Okay. The thing is, you don't want to have... I, I, when you're building a... Especially when you're building a game world, uh, you don't want to have, and again, that sort of that cult can be a great sort of red herring too. Mm. Like you're looking for missing virgins that are being sacrificed to demons, and you stumble across this cult, and it's totally not what you expect. Right. And it's like, and like, like, and you could even have it so like you know the 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 dark sacrifice cult is whose leadership is actually smart, has ba- is basically using them as sort of like this, this other cult as sort of you know a, you know smokescreen for themselves. Like, they can even be buried within that cult. That's also a pretty cool idea. So, like, you know, most people in the cult, like, even most of the, you know, the corrupt, the, the corrupt, you know, leadership that, you know, are running the scam have no fucking clue what's going on with, like, certain other members of it who are quite happy to let them, you know, do what they're doing. Think whatever they want, right. But it's like yes, and they, you know they're probably slowly trying to recruit like the uh, the 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 you know easily swayed members of the you know the 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 lower level. So, and that sort of sets up sets up a really interesting sort of like you know yeah that sets up a really se- interesting series of possible conflicts within the cult. You know, as you reveal as you know the play if, again gives the players opportunity to reveal different aspects of the cult to different people, and you know. Hmm. So you've got the, like, you know, that could even lead to, like, the players, you know, investigating the cult. It's like, okay, the, our trail leads to here. Oh, no, this is just a scam cult. Well, okay, fine, we'll fuck up the, we'll, we'll screw things up for the scammers, that's fine. And, you know, everything, okay, fine, and oh, wait, what the fuck? There is actually virgin sacrifice. What the fuck? <laughs> this is not what we intended. <laughs> everything goes completely, you know, pear-shaped. Oops. As the actual <laughs> culture reveals itself and sort of goes, Whoa, ha, ha, ha. and now we have moved closer to summoning our dread lord to this world. Yeah, ha, 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 ha. So, part of the reason why I came up with cults is um, I, I also picked up the uh, the Gene Steeler Cult Codex Jeep because oh, nice. Gene Steeler cults are awesome. Cool. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be a, an evil sorcery cult if we're doing fantasy it, it could be like the, the malign influence of some sort of bizarre alien <laughs> oh yeah sure absolutely like you know some sort of you know extra planar beings that are you know yeah it, the, the cult thing works on so many levels it could also just be general spirituality not it does not need a, a general corrupted spirituality I should say Right. Corrupted in the the most banal sense, not in the like horrible chaos cult gene sewer weirdness. 
I mean, you got the aspect of you know, sort of just the 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 this is sheer alien outsiderness of just that's warping. I mean, it's effectively you know the sort of the old ones from from Lovecraft again. Yep. You know, you know, stumbling across the wrong bit of information at the wrong time, and that starts warping you, and it starts warping the, your, your direct followers, etc. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can go for it, but you know, I'm sort of. <sighs> That's sort of a very specific to the exact sort of mesh of things there, but I mean, like, I, you know, I, I, it's 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 an interesting it brings up the interesting point of what exactly do 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 people mean when they talk about a more mature game and sort of you know mm. not, and, you know Tachi's sort of uh, sort of thing where his players sort of bring up these different points. That's you know that's part of the thing is like you know what what actually of that is you know it is more mature. Yeah. You know what do they mean by more mature? I'm like so, you know, and you know, saving virgins from sacrifice thing. That uh, to me, that doesn't ring as a more quote more mature thing to to me personally. That's just you know, okay, yeah, that's it's it's you know, it's a it's a it's a trope that shows up in fantasy from time to time. I, I mean, it's you know, it's a more violent trope, I guess, than normal, but. Well, you know, you get boobs. <laughs> yeah, uh, and again, that doesn't scream mature to me as much as, <laughs> you know. No, I understand exactly what you're saying. Right. It's And again, I'm not I'm not knocking on the player at all. I it and it can be a, that can be a more mature theme totally. But it doesn't initially scream that to me. <laughs> um it could be that he's looking for more of like a a, a Conan type of deal, right? Uh, totally, absolutely. Uh, that's exactly you know where. And who doesn't love Conan? Horrible people. That's who doesn't love Conan. <laughs> people who don't know how to have fun. <laughs> uh, you love Conan. Shut up. I enjoy. I I, I have <laughs> I have enjoyed certain aspects of. Uh, I have enjoyed various versions of Conan. Okay. I the the. The original movie is, you know, it, it's fine. The music's phenomenal. Yes, like, unbelievably be- great. And um, cinematography's really good. Hey man, James Earl Jones is great. Ah, uh, he was fun. Um, there's some good dialogue. Baker was great in that. He was fun. <laughs> Arnold was fun too. It's just he wasn't what I would like to call good. <laughs> it's a fun movie. It's actually surprisingly slow paced. Yes. Um, and it's got some great bits to it, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a good movie. It's light years better than the sequel. Well, everything's better than the sequel. <laughs> Now, if you're a sort of person who likes watching movies to riff on them, Conan Destroyer is so riffable. Oh, it totally is. Wow, is that riffable. But... Like, like seriously. <laughs> it's a terrible movie. It is double plus ungood. <laughs> oh, lordy, 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 that's a bad movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I will say I I really enjoyed some of the, the Conan comics, especially the ones that uh, Kurt Busiek wrote. Uh, yes, those un- were awesome. They had gorgeous art too. Uh, oh, the art's phenomenal! Like, oh, oh my, my god, god. yeah, they are gorgeous books. There, there is nothing bad about those books, other than there are not enough of them. Yeah, yeah, basically, I mean, anyway, <laughs> shock of shocks, Busiek wrote something and I liked it. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> uh, that never happens, Peter. <laughs> I've I've not read anything by Busek that I've not enjoyed. I that's it's that simple. I there's a reason he's my favorite comic author. I think there are other authors that have written things that are better than the stuff Busek writes, but he is the only au- comic author I've ever read that is con- that has consist has never written anything I've disliked. He has been mm. consistently good to great. Like I literally, I can't think of anything I w- I've not thought of with th- that I've read of his that I thought, yeah, that was th- that th- that was, didn't think it was like, yeah, that was really good. Like that doesn't happen. 
Like, even Warren Ellis' head misses. And I think Warren Ellis is one of the best comic writers ever. Yeah. And, like, God, oh, God help me, like, you know, as much as I love Alan Moore, he's had some real stinkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many vaginas can I fit on this page? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, also it doesn't help that Alan Moore is a crazy man. Uh... <laughs> he is, in fact, a crazy man. <laughs> I love Alan Moore. I love him to death. But don't try to tell me he's not a crazy man. Oh, lordy. But yeah, I, like... He's really a crazy I, man. I, the, the, I think the only other comic author I can think of who, like, I think is as consistently good as, as a writer I, that I can think of off the top of my head is Mignola. Yeah. Like, seriously, like, I've not read anything by Mignola I didn't think was really good. Um, and... Yeah, I, I love me some, some Mike Mignola. Like, He's amazing. Something fierce. Um, plus, I adore his artwork. Oh, like, I Jesus totally, Christ, it yeah. is. He's, what he, the, what he is he one does, of my favorite artists, period. I totally, <laughs> I totally grok that. And his style is just so unique. Yes. Um, like there's a lot of, uh, of influence uh, of um, like German expressionists and woodcut, and, and just yeah, I adore his stuff. Yeah, totally rock. But you know, that's you know not really to do with our topic per se. But actually, you know that it sort of is though. It sort of is because he's <sighs> Mignola's stuff is itself very four color, but very mature at the same time. Yes, that's exactly um, it. Like, like the, the, the core conflict with Hellboy is nature versus nurture. Right. Like, like Hellboy wants to be a good person, has been raised to be a good person, but he has this terrible destiny because of his birth. And he literally wears it on his face. And things happen around him because of what he is, not who he is. Right. And Rasputin shows up, because of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, even, even the, 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 the birth, Hellboy's birth, for lack of a better term, is tainted in that he's summoned by Nazi magic scientists. Right. <laughs> that is not a thing that you want hanging over you. <laughs> yeah, no, Hellboy is a great example of a sort of, it, from, for the comic books, a mature... An actual mature version of sort of, you know, a lot of pulp A very games. pulpy sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's brilliant. And it, it, it's one of the best things I've ever read. I, I've, I've never, I've not read all of Hellboy because I just haven't had the opportunity, but. Yeah, I'm, I, I am behind. Hellboy ended not long ago and I'm waiting for it all to be collected in a giant omnibus that I can drop $3,000 on and then clutch to my chest and mutter my precious. <laughs> <laughs> The really amazing thing is that you mentioned dropping a lot of money on it as like one big omnibus, and I'm sure you're envisioning you clutching it to your chest, whispering my precious as at it as you were saying that. <laughs> that was literally the mental image I had, Eric. Uh, yes, Tachi. Um, Hell Hellboy in Hell ended not long ago, uh, and Mike has said that he is done with it, though other people can play with it. Right. Yes, I know it is a terrible, sad thing, and is a monstrous thing, and it makes me sad. But I'd rather it end well than it go on forever. Yep, no, totally. No, no, I, I totally approve of it having an end. Yes. Like, yes. It, Hellboy, is, like, that's a story that has to have an end. It just, it, yeah. it is. Uh, BPRD is still running, though, so. Right. Um... Uh, BPRD has always been more consistent because that's like the you want to do something with the Hellboy storyline. Here you go, go play with the art BPRD. Um, but <laughs> Mike's been very free but protective of Hellboy. He's had a lot of artists work on it, but he's pretty much the only guy that writes Hellboy himself. So, right. and I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, well, he does own it. <laughs> it yeah. is his. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, the, like another example of a story I think ended that ended that it was that was you know short and ended before ended sort of before I I wanted to I wanted more of it but I'm glad it ended was Gravity Falls. Yeah, yeah. 
Which is another surprisingly mature show for yes. kids. Yes, yes, absolutely. Holy fuck. I'm Bill interested. Cipher is the best Disney villain. I challenge you to find someone better in the in Disney cartoons than Bill Cipher. Okay, you you added cartoons there, Eric. I'm 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 glad for your sanity. <laughs> well, Darth Vader is technically in Disney's canon now, so <laughs> that's why that's why I was just, I was a little surprised you said Bill Cipher is the best Disney villain. But then you added cartoons, and I'm like, okay, Eric, Eric, Eric has not lost it yet. Good. <laughs> because I actually agree with your statement on that point. But, you know. Okay. <laughs> you know, when Disney bought, um, bought Lucasfilm and, and Star Wars, I just had this image, because you know how Disney sometimes does a thing where they have all the, the heroes and villains from their different, from their stuff show up, at, at, like hang out in like ballrooms and stuff. Uh-huh. I had this, like, image in my head of, like, Captain Hook and Maleficent and, like, um, the the other cartoon Disney villains sitting there squabbling, being annoyed at always losing. So we needed some fresh blood. And then Captain Hook gets force choked and slammed in the wall and Darth Vader walks in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, yeah, no, I'm thinking, so, yeah. But back to the t- the topic at hand, I-, I think sort of it might be helpful to sort of look at some sort of more sort of not specific to Tachi situation ways to sort of how one makes things some, a game a bit makes a game thing a bit more mature than what you usually do, um, right? And I think part of it honestly ties ties into actually having some themes that you want to explore. Yeah, it's you know it's sort of look at the ways that you can make a story more more mature, and it's not you know sex and violence necessarily that makes something more mature. It's actually approaching something with a from a with you know thoughts and theme and concept in mind. Um, and that's not always going to work in a tabletop in an RPG because you know you're throwing into that the mix of what the players are going to do. Right. But like, uh, for instance, uh, and a great example of a, mat- a fairly mature uh, tabletop RPG is is Amber. We've talked about it yep. before. But Amber comes with part of the reason it's it's a, such a mat- it's a mature game is it comes in with this baked in built in concept of these very different sort of you know conflict and themes. Like you know, one of the big driving themes in Amber is the sort of inherent conflict. That is driven by the Amber, the, the royal royal family of Amber. You know, right? You know the. It's you know because you've got you know they're you know it, everyone is jockeying for position in you know. As squabbling over a sort of power, but you know when when push comes to shove, the family does the family pull mm-hmm. together to you know protect the realm. And that's sort of, that's an inherent sort of you know. Well, they do, except for Brand because he's a jerk. Well, and again, that's part of you know. You know, it, that's it's a, part of the, the bag, yeah. Right, <laughs> and it, there's you know just the, and sort of the conflict and sort of the dichotomy between you know sort of you know the chaotic squabbling mess that is the family of that the, that and the, that is Am- that is the the courts of Amber, because it's it you know. It's topsy turvy. It has you know, there's one very clear head of the family, which is Oberon, and when he's gone, it just falls into chaos. And right. which, you know, and which, and then you've got the contrasting the courts of chaos, which is regimented and ordered. The lines of succession are very clear and regimented, and they, and there's this weird sort of economy, of like you know, it's very ordered, and at least on the surface, everyone gets along in the courts of chaos, and it's very there's a lot of familial respect and. You know all this stuff, and then you've got the, the over on the Amber side. It's chaotic, and there's backbiting and infighting, and all this stuff, which seems like co- both of them seem like sort of contrary to sort of the, you know, because Amber is sort of the sort of you know built around regimented orders, built around the pattern, and chaos. Right. The courts of chaos are built around literally built around you know chaos, chaos, you know, and the and disorder, and it's those two themes. That's a very sort of and looking at that sort of in internal sort of conflict is very interesting and how a, a, how both of these things actually reinforce the central themes of, of their right exactly um, yeah because well well the courts of amber are, are constantly backbiting and, and 
for lack of a better term, on, on the surface chaotic. Um, it, it's when you start digging deep, you see that it's all that's all just a release because they're they are themselves so so regimented. They've got they're about enforcing the order, and they all have their own ideas about how to do it, and are so. <sighs> So stagnant in their views of it, they can't accept the other one's uh, perspective. Right, exactly. Well, everyone gets along in chaos because it's chaos. No one, everyone has their own ideas about how things should, should do it, but are willing to hear everyone else out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and their views are mutable with um, additional information and other pre uh, perspectives. Right. Doesn't necessarily, which sounds better, but isn't. <laughs> in the case of the Courts of Chaos. In the case of the Courts of Chaos. Purely in that case, I want to say. <laughs> yes, no, it's... Because it's, do we flinch them, flay them, or simply tear the meat from their bones? Well, I can see the, the perspectives from all of those. Well, but it's even, not even just that. It's, you know, there's the dichotomy and the... the I mean, the big thing at the courts, there is a big sort of, you know, the courts, it's all, like, a large part of what they want, the, the sort of driving goal of the courts is, and there's a sort of, there are two sort of competing sort of uh, outlooks about, and specifically about what about what to do about Amber. Mm. Because, you know, it, this is a bit of a story spoiler, but Amber is, a, is you know, the, the royal family Amber, you know, Oberon originally is a prince of chaos. Right, and he created Amber. <laughs> well, who else would Oberon be? You've got primordial chaos and the void. Those are two choices, <laughs> right? No, no, so, and as a definition of the void, is there's nothing, <laughs> right? But the big thing, the important bit is, is that you know, so Amber has been created as 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 a point of actual order and 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 substance. And so, you know, and has come to sort of dominate the sort of the shadows in between. And so the you know, the courts, basically, they're, they're two, two sort of differing viewpoints. One is, all right, well, you know, you know, that's all well and fine. And sort of it may, and in many ways, it's sort of maybe something of a perversion of what we want. But we have to, we have to find a way to make things, make, to make, to achieve a better balance with Amber. So it's it's so it's you know so that there's balance between order and chaos, and mm. you know, so they want to weaken Amber, but they don't want to destroy it. Uh, and then there's the other half of chaos, which is all about no, no, we wipe out Amber and return everything back to the primordial chaos because that's what's supposed to be. Right. There isn't supposed to be order out there. It's everything is supposed to be chaos. And then there's Brand, who wants to blow up Amber and recreate, build, who create his own Amber in his own image, because Oberon clearly, clearly screwed things up. Yeah. The the order, is, it's like the, the the pattern is irredeemable. It must be destroyed. So I will remake it in my own image because I have been listening to Doctor Doom too much, or Dark Side. Or Thanos. Well, not really Thanos. <laughs> well, I mean, the big thing is that Brand is convinced that he is smarter than everybody, and he's not yep. entirely wrong. He is entirely evil. <laughs> he's crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's batshit crazy. I mean, he's he's you know he's always been manic depressive, uh, and he's always had sort of a dark side to him, and he's. But I mean, you can understand where he comes from, like looking at the pattern, like what what the result of Oberon's pattern has been. It's been this family that does not get along and is like constantly, you know, infighting. And like it even comes to the point where like they like you know, it comes to blows, and sometimes like it you know people get hurt. It's like this is wrong. This is not what family's supposed to be. <laughs> right. And you know, if this is what Oberon created, then it he, it clearly created wrong. I there and you know I. And, it, and everything worked mostly while Oberon was there, but Oberon's gone now. Now, mind you, it may, Bran may have had something to do with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, 
But again, this this is like that's the sort of thing you can do if, if you're approaching something from a more sort of from if you want to create a uh, sort of mature game. Is again, themes like that are are what will ma- can often make a game feel much more mature. And, you know, and again, mm. like you know, you know the other stuff that they meant, and that's part of the reason that I think the people have mentioned Babylon Five for Tachi. Again, there's there's you know there there's some actual ongoing you know, sort of questions and themes, and sort of you know, sort of thoughtful look and a sort of more mature thoughtful look at what's how things are what's what's happening. That definitely had that definitely will lend to that, you know. You know, you like one of the great like a great example of that is sort of the uh, the the difference between what the how the Vorlons and the Shadows operate. Yes. And that sort of is entirely sum, summated summed up by you know the 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 two questions: Who are you, and what, what do you, do you want? want? Right. You know, the Vorlons the Vorlons big question is who are you, and the Shadows question is what do you want? And they both detest. The and Uncle people. Iroh asks both questions. <laughs> well, yes. Uncle Iroh is wise. Why isn't it in both these elder being uh, races? <laughs> yes, that's because Iroh is amazing. Uh, yes, and they're both fundamental idiots. I'm, I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> the as a whole, I would agree with you. There are indivi- there, are, there there is at least there, one... there are very brilliant individuals um, and, and on both, but the. Yes, uh, it's I, another example of two forces that have been, are so stagnant and, and rigid in their beliefs that they can't see the benefits of the other side. Right. To the point where even asking Kosh, "What do you want?" sends flies makes him fly into a rage. It annoys. Well, it doesn't fly. It him a rage. Well, it, it annoys, annoys him. him. <laughs> and Kosh is by and far the most you know ed, most open minded and well-adjusted Vorlon that yes. we encounter. I mean, mind you, we encounter two. <laughs> One's a psychopath. <laughs> Olkesh is, yeah, yeah. yeah Olkesh is a psychopath. He's a <laughs> He is a and, crazy man. And, you know, and you also see, like, you know, how very different the Vorlons operate when Kosh is gone. Yes. It's like, oh. Oh. Right, um... Yeah, Kosh we is pretty much the guy holding them in, uh, holding them back. Well, Ka- Kosh is very clearly the one who basically had the plan, and now the plan yep. is gone. We we need a new plan. Fuck it, crush the shadows. Screw it. Anyone associated with them, crush them. Um, are are, are you sure about this? This seems awfully, you know. Shadow like, you know. No, if we crush them. <laughs> Dust off, nuke it from orbit, only way to be sure. Uh but yeah, that that sort of, you know the the dichotomy, just just, just that, that, that central theme though of the Yeah the difference in, you know, the, the those two questions and how both sides got them wrong. Yes. Oh, again, like like a mature uh, as oh, an example, a mature look at Star Wars, and the, yes. the Jedi Sith conflict. Like, I was also like, going to to say like the the tendency to take what are absolutely good ideas and twist them upon themselves until they become corrupted by their own right lunacy. Right. I mean, uh, as as mature TM as the Chaos Guards are in. in Warhammer, uh, they they're f- fairly mature once you dissect them. They're just not often portrayed in a terribly mature absolutely. manner. Yes, absolutely, I'd agree with that completely. There is a core of it. Forty K has a, you could do a very mature, dark and grim un- sort of story, you know, universe with with the Forty K universe. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Like like it is it is rife for that kind of of storytelling. Um, from even from a, a an RPG standpoint. Yep. Um, and it's just not usually presented I, that way. I, yeah, and I've I've been in a, a Dark Heresy game that that did that excellently, um, partially because of great players and a great game master. Right. And um, yeah, and like I said, like the Chaos Guards are are each effectively a good thing twisted upon itself until it's become corrupted and is unrecognizable. <laughs> 
Yeah. Even <laughs> corn and Nurgle, dude. No, no, Nurgle. I've no, Nurgle. I believe corn's the one that's a little tricky. Corn's. <sighs> Corn is a desire for martial prowess to protect what you care about. I guess. Yeah, I can see that. I can see it. I, I and see it's that. taken to such an extreme yep. that what you want to protect doesn't matter anymore. It's just more skulls for the pile. Oh yeah, no, and you no, know, and I love like my honestly my favorite thing for, for the chaos gods is the dichotomy between Zinch and Nurgle. You know, yes, of, of entropy and change. Just I yes I. That dichotomy is, I think, my favorite thing in the of, in, in the Chaos Gods. One of the things I like about Zinch that I don't see get brought up a lot is everything is going according to plan because the plan is constantly changing, whether or not it's for the better of the plan or not. Right. <laughs> no, that's that, and that's the reason Zinch is such. I, I've always found Zinch. He, Zinch is easily my favorite of the Chaos Gods. Yeah, and. Just I used to be Slanesh just because of my my artistic streak, but it's um it's become Nurgle. Just oh, the, yeah. the like the good natured nihilism of Nurgle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I find Nurgle fascinating. The, the, the happy fatalist uh, uh, of Nurgle. I, I adore that. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. Uh, and yeah. uh, again, like the, just the uh, the bizarre sort of you know. And, like, it, Nurgle embodies a necessary force. Yes. But perverts it, which is really interesting. Like, decay and, you know, entropy is so, is a fundamental building, is a fundamental part of the universe. And Nurgle sort of, you know... Not only that, just, um, just stability and stasis. Oh, yeah. A, a, like, again, taking to such an... Ex- Extreme. It's just rot and disease now. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's it's, and like you know, and for Zinch, it's become change for change's sake. Right. Like it's it's not progress. It's change, which is totally different. Yes. A just uncontrolled, chaotic change. <laughs> for its own sake, which is again. One of the things I find fascinating about Zinch is, is, and I think it's one of the reasons I think he's one of the most interesting of the Chaos Gods, and with Nurgle a close second, like a very, very yeah. close second. And then Slash is, you know, I, I think... My Slash... biggest problem with Korn is that he's an evil war god, and we are so inundated with evil war gods. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I like, I... I want to like Slanesh more than I do. <laughs> I, Ugh. like I said, I used to really enjoy Slanesh, but it was more of a, a, a I don't know. Slane- I feel like I've grown out of Slanesh and into Orcs is what's happened. <laughs> I, I've grown out of Chaos and into Orcs is basically what's happened with me. Oh, sure. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. sure. Uh, and, um... Out of Slanesh and into Nurgle, which is, um, makes sense in a weird kind of way. You know, you have all that sex, you're going to end up with something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but yeah, again, sort of like, like as a, back to the, the, I, I was just sort of talking about the Star Wars thing, uh, sort of, you know, the Jedi sure, Sith yes. thing. I like, here, here's the thing. I personally, prefer Star Wars to be I think Star Wars does need to be a little bit less mature to be Star Wars. It needs that yes. actual bit of black versus white. That doesn't well, mean that Star Wars be... is fundamentally sort of black versus white. Well it's a, it's a space uh, opera. Despite the fact I enjoy Star Wars best when it's um playing in the gray areas with the, the well, scum you, and villainy. You you need it's even but even, like even with the sort of you know that there, there is still room for some gray in the middle, which I think is interesting. Right. And, like, I like the fact, like, I, I conceptually like the fact that the, you know, that both the Sith and the Jedi have gotten their ethos is wrong. It's just yes. that, like, I... Well, oh, but, yeah, just the idea that both of them have, have taken the their, their primary ethoses and, again, through... St- 
stubborn dog blood failed to get the point. <laughs> right. But like, I, I think my, the thing that for my approach, if I'm, if, when I want to handle like a, like when I handle a sort of a Star Wars game, I do like, I, I often will bring that sort of, you know, that, that aspect in. But there is one element where the Jedi got things right, which is that they embraced the light side, not the dark side. Mm. Because, again, it's, you know, it, I'm trying to stick with the, you know, there is a definitive good and a definitive evil. Because without that, Star Wars sort of, you know, becomes bad Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> like, it becomes bad sci-fi then, and it, it, stops being, it stops being a space opera and being space, or, you know, sci- science fantasy and moves into not really that interesting science fiction. Hmm. Like that's that's the thing is like I there is something about Star Wars that there it it needs those two poles, and I like I can like totally see like you know like I don't see there's anything wrong conceptually with someone who operates on a lot of what the Sith code sort of focuses around and embracing the light, right? In the same no, way that it, I can, it, like, it is I totally, a, a way. Like you can also totally see a Jedi falling into the dark and still feeling like they are they maintain the Jedi ethos, despite they clearly aren't. Like what the Jedi ethos should be. Right. I mean, you could argue that Vader still adheres to the Jedi ethos. Uh, he he is adhering to to a, a rigid hierarchy. He um. He is all about enforcing order and, and justice, quotation marks, yep. <laughs> and does not tolerate failure because failure leads to corruption. Right. Oh, yeah. Never mind that all of this is itself a, a corruption of itself. <laughs> well, yeah, again, it, it, you know, absolutely. And, no, and I think that's really, really interesting. And again, that's sort of the thing. I think you can do some really interesting, mature stuff there within Star Wars while still retaining what is Star what Star Wars is. Right. And that's the sort of thing I sort of you know I I, I find really interesting. And it's one of the reasons I find the Grey Jedi so infuriating. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, aha, no, 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 you got to balance between light and the dark. And it's like, no, that's not Star Wars, you idiots. That's something else entirely. Like, I, I can see. I, I I don't have the the problem with the gray Jedi as a concept. Well, I, here's the thing. But they I, should be so fucking rare because you're you're riding the knife's edge the whole time. Yeah, no, no. And, and actually, I, I agree with you. Anyone but the most Zen of Zen masters managing to pull that off at any length of time. I actually, actually, Eric, I agree with you. I don't hate gray Jedi in concept. Jolie Bindo is my favorite character in Knights of the Old Republic. Hmm. But you are completely right. Walking that line is... It's hard to write that. As a writer, fuck, yeah. that's a hard thing to write. And let alone as a... Per- being let as alone a actually do it. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. So, yeah, like, I... But again, again we've got, you know, the, the, the Jedi... The Jedi at their heart want to be Zen Buddhists. You know, they want to... Right. They want to be people who follow the Dalai Lama, you know. They do it really badly. <laughs> they do it really badly. And, you know, at their core, you know, the Sith ethos is all about, you know, personal, you know... Uh, self-actualization, basically. Yeah, basically. And, and, and psyching yourself up and, and embracing the things that make you you and enjoying that. Right, and, you know, and, you know... But then you go, like, total psychopath objectivist with it. Right, <laughs> but yeah, the, right, it's like, no, 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 no! <laughs> oh, you idiots... But again, it's like you can see how both those paths can fall into those traps, and that's interesting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, it's one of the things I, as I said, I adore. I, there's a lot of things I adore about Star Wars, and that one of the, and I think part of the reason you can that stuff shows up so well, and you can easily see that is because Star Wars has that sort of light versus dark thing going there. Sure. Good versus the very clear good versus evil thing, which allows it to cast these shadows for you to, to see and dissect and, and analyze. And if it wasn't for the fact that Star Wars was about that dichotomy, I don't think it'd be you'd be able to see that as clearly. Not the way Star Wars is done. 
you can yeah, do you can, I, I you can think... totally it's, have that sort of introspective, but you have to come at it from a different angle if you're not doing it from a sort of a, a from that dichotomy. Yeah, and, and that's where I think um, playing up the the space scum aspect of things, because you can get that uh, that sort of similar dichotomy between say Han Solo and, for lack of a better Better character, Boba Fett. Yeah. I I I have to draw from the EU here because, well, what do we know about Boba Fett in the movies? Um, He caught, he he was a skip tracer and caught Han Solo. Then he was a buffoon and fell into a giant death vagina. Also, he had to be told by, he also had to be told by Vader not to disintegrate Han. Yeah. No disintegrations. This is not what you want. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but yeah. but like, using what we know about Boba Fett from there, Boba Fett's actually more like the the Jedi thing, in, in that he's very austere in, in, in the way he approaches things. Mm-hmm. Well, Han's very much like has much more of like the, the the Sith code to him and that he's about doing things for him for himself and enjoying what he has. Right. But the so, yeah. But the really <laughs> the big difference is that, you know, the two of them have very like Han actually has like a set of actual morals that he actually falls follows follows by. There are things right. like yeah, he's a crook and a criminal, and he's a smuggler. There are things he won't do, and things he won't right. stand for. Which is not true at all of Boba Fett. Uh, of Mr. Fett. Right. As long as you have the money, and as long as you tell me why you want this person, and I think that's a good reason, I will do it. Right, it, it, which is really, it, it, I, I agree with you completely. The dude broke a deal, that's a perfectly good reason. Don't care what the deal was, he broke a deal. <laughs> don't care what the deal was, don't care why he broke the deal, doesn't matter. He broke the deal. <laughs> I will get him for you because he broke a deal. And the deal is everything. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the sort of thing I think actually, you know, again, that's, you know, coming in with that sort of, mindset is I think where you can start getting things it's the I think the most important area to start making things more to making a game more mature I think sort of you know at least my take on it yeah and I was going to go somewhere with this but I completely spaced (laughs) Oh, I believe me. That's happened to me a few uh, my, times. My, the, the thought just literally fell down into my lizard brain. It's going to come up at like 3 a.m. in the middle of a dream, and it's going to be a really weird dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh... <laughs> well, all right. Um, hmm. Let's see. Anything? Any other... Any other, any sir, any other ways you think you can think about sort of adding some maturity to a tabletop game? Um, the only thing I have to say is uh, avoid the the pitfall of yeah, mature. Let's go rape some bitches and stab some folk. Yeah, yeah, I, because I, the, <sighs> breaking taboo for taboo's sake can be fun once, but quickly. <sighs> It's like diving into a pool of cold, um, uh, uh, of cold uh, violator grease. It might be fun to say you did it once, but you're really going to need a shower, and you're never going to want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, you know, sex and violence don't inherently make things more mature. Just is it right. It just gets. To. It just gets the mature rating from standards and practices which doesn't actually mean anything yeah <laughs> no I mean the, and there are and don't get me wrong the adding sex and violence can make things more mature it depends on how you approach it you do it's, how, it. it's how it's done right absolutely like honestly like 
at the same time, like almost anything we've talked about, like adding that doesn't in- won't inherently make it more mature. It depends on how you do it and right how how your players grab it. And again, it and if your players are asking for something more mature, they might not be asking for things to actually be more mature. They might be asking for things to be harder. Right, which is fine. That's a totally valid thing to ask for. And that's one of the things I liked about Tachi's like Tachi's uh, question when he when he when he, when he wrote it. Is it? It made it very clear that he talked to his players about what they meant by they wanted to be more mature, right? And that's crucial. <laughs> Absolutely. Like one person sounds like they want like more politics. One person sounds like they wanted um more more like Frank um um more Vallejo stuff. Th- thank you, Vallejo stuff. <laughs> and the other one sounded like um. What did the other one want? They wanted to be, they wanted, they oh, wanted, they wanted more consequences. Yeah. Which is why, like, but in the first thought I had in satisfying all of that was cults. Yeah, and but I told, yeah, totally. It's a, it's a great idea in and of itself. It, it's a great answer for that specific situation. Yes. And honestly, you know, a good cult plot is always, it can, can is often entertaining in almost any game. Like, yeah, honestly. Uh, who doesn't the, like a good cult plot? <laughs> like, it fits into almost any genre. Like, seriously. It, it really does. <laughs> like, you know, fantasy, no problem. Science fiction, no problem. Superheroes, yeah. no problem. Like. Uh, it, it, film noir, easy peasy. Like, <laughs> literally, I can't think of a, like, can you think of a genre where cults don't, would not fit in at all? <sighs> Rom-com? No, I think you could do a cult-based rom-com. I think, I think you could do it in a rom-com. I think, yeah, I think I so. I think it'd be actually kind of awesome, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a really that, weird sort of way. I, I, thinking about it, I, yeah, yeah, no. It, you could totally Shaun the Dead that up. It'd be great. <laughs> like, like you, you say, like, you know, rom-com with cults. Like, I immediately think... Okay, when the when when it when is this Cohen Brothers movie coming out? I mean, yeah, no shit. <laughs> or have they already done this? Like the Cohen Brothers probably already made this movie. They probably already made that movie. Yes. <laughs> like seriously, I mean, that's like right up their fucking alley. <laughs> like I don't love everything the Cohen Brothers have done, but dear God, they've done they've done some interesting stuff, <laughs> and they do a lot of weird shit. Yeah. Actually, I'm trying to think of... Yeah, the Coen Brothers have done, been, done a few movies I'm not a big fan of, but they've done several I'm a big fan of, so... Mm. But yeah, um... Huh. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of other th- other sort of little things that, that could be done, but I think that's... We've mostly covered what we need to cover, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's more shit we can come up with and whatnot, but yeah, it's, we haven't touched on Star Trek at all, but I don't think we really need to. Star Trek is always at least trying to be mature. Yeah, well, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't always succeed. Sometimes you end up with uh, Spock's brain or the one where Captain Janeway turned into a giant newt. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Or Code of Honor. Or Code of Honor. Wow, I hate that episode. Everyone that hates that episode. It's episode. terrible. It's a it, terrible it episode. The, the only one that's worse is the clip show from season two of TNG. Oh. Was it season two? It was a clip show. Yeah. Um, and that's not my least favorite simply because it wasn't offensive, just boring. <laughs> Right. Yeah, um... Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh... I guess our little sort of thing on making a game more mature. Uh... (laughs) (laughs) I hope, uh... I hope uh, you guys found this useful. Uh, I hope we said something that might be of help to somebody somewhere because uh, we tried. <laughs> we probably failed miserably. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be surprised if we did. But yeah, um, I, I do think... Uh, oh, the second season finale. Yeah, that's what it was that you're talking about, Tachi. Uh, Eric. Right, right. Okay. 
<laughs> Anyways, thank you everybody for listening. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something useful out of it. Um, as usual, we try to save time at the end of each episode for reviewer questions. Uh, we've rambled on a bit long tonight, uh, and I don't think we really have time for them this week. And we don't. Mm-hmm. We have a bunch of questions that could be that are either sort of questions or or show topics that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, so yeah, um, we'll we'll try to get to those at some point in a future. We'll get episode. to them eventually. Who knows? We might um, actually just we might just do those as a do like do that do a Q and A show with those. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. So, uh, yeah, that's a possibility. Either way, though, I think that's going to do it for this week. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you guys had fun. Uh, as I said, uh, we record the show Monday nights here on hitbox.tv slash mecha-gm. Uh, when we... I do tweet out when we go live. My Twitter handle is at mecha-gm. Uh, but as I was saying, we do try to save time for viewer questions. If you have questions you'd like us to answer, please email them to us. Our email address is surlygrognards at yahoo.com, S-U-R-L-Y-G-R-O-G-N-A-R-D-S at yahoo.com. Or you can post them in the comment section on YouTube. Uh, or, I guess, if you're listening to this on... Uh, no, you can't listen to this anywhere else. Never mind. So, yes. <laughs> I have not been uploading this to up, uploading this to an MP3 format because I'd have to upload all of them, and there are far too many episodes to go back and try to, re, to ca- recapture. So, oh my god. Ah... At any rate, um, yeah, so, um, right, questions. If you've got feedback for us, ways we can make the show better, uh, constructive criticism, we love that. Please send it to us. Um, one thing I want to say before we head out that's unrelated. Yep. Um, the FCC is fucking with net neutrality again. Go yell at them. Go to their website and yell at them. Yeah, it's uh, down yeah. right now because everyone's yelling at them, but everyone needs to yell at them. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you're in the states, uh, please, dear God, get on this fucking bandwagon. It is a good bandwagon to be on. It, yes, it is something everyone from every side of the aisle can agree on, except for corporate shills. So, dear God, just please, 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 go. go yeah, we we did it before. We got to do it again. We can, we can do it again. It, it's annoying that we have to, but we can do it again. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, Eric. Anyways, uh, yeah, if you've got show topics, also if you've got show topic suggestions, you know, same places. But yeah, again, more importantly, get, get on that, get the fuck on the FCC. And Yeah, and, and I'm sorry to bring that in. I know we tried to stay pretty political here, but they're fucking worth our house, man. <laughs> they are. Uh, and uh, yeah. At any rate, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hope you guys had fun, uh, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care, everybody. Have a great, great rest of your week. Bye.